what's up guys welcome back here we are gonna download java 11 okay so all you need to do is you need to go to uh, google or you need to open your browser and just type in download jdk 11 you'll find the first link at java archive downloads and go to this page and you can select the operating system that you have it could be either Linux or a Mac or a Windows okay so I have a Windows so I'm gonna select this one and uh, it, it will give you a pop-up like this and you'll say I have reviewed and accept this terms and conditions and you'll say download okay so uh, <coughs> here right now I'm actually signed in into this uh, Oracle so that's the reason it started my download directly but if you are not signed in or if you do not have an oracle account you might be prompted to log into your oracle account or if you don't have one you can create an account for, for oracle and once you do that uh, and you uh, sign into your oracle account you can actually see that jdk 11 would be downloaded into your system okay so uh, that's how you actually uh, download the jdk uh, once you double click on this JDK and uh, go through these screens, it's uh, pretty much self-explanatory. Just uh, go through those screens once you double click on this and install this JDK into your system. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial and see you in the next class. Thank you. What's up guys, welcome to this new tutorial. In this tutorial, we are going to start to learn the Java programming with a small hello world program and the purpose of writing this program is to print hello world on the screen and as we discussed earlier we are going to use notepad or a text editor in order to write the program as you can see on the screen here's a little roadmap of what we are going to learn about the hello world first we are going to understand the theory and the concept of the hello world program then we are going to look at the entry point and then we're going to eventually move on to see what happens when we compile the program and then later what happens when we execute the program. All right. Well, now you can see on the screen the Hello World program that I have already typed into a notepad and I also saved it. Let's understand this Hello World program bit by bit so to begin with we all know that Java is an object-oriented programming language all right so everything in Java is going to be associated with classes and objects just remember this statement uh, for the rest of this course which would help you understand certain concepts all right so the basically whenever you try to learn any any language the first thing that is required is to learn the grammar and the way some uh, certain things are expected to be in order for the other person to understand in a similar manner even java has certain grammar which we call it as syntax all right so by syntax we mean there are certain keywords which the java JDK compiler would understand and then act accordingly. Alright, so having said that, let's try to understand the hello world.java program. Alright, let's start from the first line. Here we see there are there is something like author and it's my name printed, which now means that this this uh, Java program has been typed by me and I'm the author. However, as you can see, there are two forward slashes, which indicate a comment in Java. All right, then that's about the comments. Now let's move on to the other part. The other part is beginning from here. As we can see, we've got an, the, the syntax is highlighted here. So there's an optional access modifier then we got a class keyword then we got a class name so <coughs> how does it look like here it is it's public 
is an access modifier we have got the class keyword then we got a class name and remember in java that all the keywords are present in a small letter are present in small case so let's let's first briefly discuss on what is an access modifier so basically an access modifier will tell you or tell the compiler whether the particular class is can be accessed from any other class or not so basically the public keyword that we are seeing here denotes that the class and its public members or public methods can be accessed from any other class of java from where they are being called okay so don't don't worry if you're being too overwhelmed by what we are trying to say here we will definitely discuss these concepts in the later part in more detail all right so for now just try to understand that the access modifier is something which tries to specify the compiler whether the class is accessible from any other java program or not okay moving forward the next thing is the class modifier class uh, keyword the class keyword denotes that this is a certain class that we are trying to declare we got a class name which uniquely uh, which uniquely identifies a class which we for now we have said hello world as a class name now notice that the hello world is exactly written the way we have written the hello world.java here so the file name matches with the class name which is a very important concept to note okay all right now the class the contents of a class are always enclosed in curly braces so here we have a curly brace which denotes that the class body is starting and here we have a curly brace which denotes that the class body is ending all right moving on so now that we've just briefly understood what and how we declare a class we look at the contents which are inside the class so now assume that the class is like a box and there are certain more smaller boxes present inside the class and this is how your usual java program would look like so now as we can see here this piece of code is a method okay the method starts from here there is some kind of declaration syntax here then we got curly braces where we denote that the method body has started just like the class and then we have the ending curly brace which denotes that the method body has ended then there are certain logic written over here okay so now the main method is what we are going to talk about in the next piece so basically again as we can see here that there is one more comment which denotes the syntax of the method so we have got an access modifier we've got a keyword which is static here we'll understand the meaning of the static keyword and the later part then we got a return type so again we'll try to understand what a return type is in the later part then we got a method name to uniquely identify a method and then we got certain arguments which could be passed to that method so again the meaning of access modifier remains the same here just like it was in the class which means that we denote whether the method can be accessed by the outside world or from some or from anywhere else then we've got a static keyword which for now just remember that methods with a static keyword do not require an object to be created of the class they can be directly invoked okay don't worry about if if you don't understand don't worry just just uh, remember that this is how it is and in the later piece of the course we'll definitely get into more details of what static means so 
just to repeat again static means if a, if a method is declared as static it means that no object needs to be created of the class and it can be simply invoked by the method name like class name dot method name all right the next piece is the return type yet again we see here that nothing is actually returned per se by this method so we declared it as void there could be other type of return types as well which we'll cover in more detail in the tutorial then we got this main which is the name of the method so this is a special method method now every java program has to have an entry point and the java compiler understands the entry point as the main method so any method declared with the name as main and with this kind of a syntax java understands that yes they have to start executing this program from this point or from this method okay now we've got these round brackets and uh, we have written string and argument here which again means that there are certain arguments that you could pass to the method from uh, so that the method could use these arguments in order to execute logic or in order to calculate something all right so that's about how a method can be the next piece is the method logic which we have written so in order to print hello world this is a single line of code that we have written we are saying that the system okay this is this is the single line of code which we are using in order to print hello world on the command prompt so what we are basically trying to do is we're trying to tell the system we're trying to give an output to the system we are going to say print on the next print uh, print on the screen the on the output screen and what do we want to print we want to print hello world which again has to be present in the double quotes okay so that's it about a brief description of what hello world program is a brief description of the syntax of hello world program don't worry if you didn't understand or if you didn't get or if you didn't follow certain certain concepts we are going to definitely cover them up in the upcoming tutorials all right but for now just remember this is the bare minimum program that you need in order to print hello world now you may not write these comments which are optional you may simply not write it that's also fine but just to show you that this is how comments are written i've just included them here in the class all right in the next next tutorial all right that's it for this tutorial see you in the next tutorial thank you what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial here we are going to see what happens when we compile the program and what happens when we execute the program all right so we're going to again look at the hello world program that we just wrote uh, in the previous lecture and uh, all right so now that we are already ready with what we have written we want to save this um, i mean i've already saved it but just to show you uh, how to save it uh, we say that we'll save this as all files and we'll write it as hello world.java all right so this already exists however i'm going to simply replace it okay so <clears throat> this is how it looks if uh, this is my folder path where i have uh, saved my hello world.java program and now i'm going to open my command prompt by typing cmd on the windows so i'm just going to open my command prompt and i'm going to navigate to the location in which the hello world.java program is present okay so <clears throat> i'm going to simply say e drive and then i'm going to say cd okay so i've navigated to the folder in which my hello world.java program is present 
and let me just clear the screen okay so I want to compile this program okay now what is this compile so what we wrote in that hello world of Java was plain English however the computer or the Java program the Java compiler however in order to execute a program it won't understand a language like English or a language which we speak it understands only bytes and bits so in order to do that we need to first compile the program so that's what we are going to do and we need to write a command like Java C which means Java compiler hello world dot Java which means we are telling the Java compiler to compile hello world dot Java okay and we now press enter so if there are no errors it's going to create a dot class file as you can see here in the same folder okay so let's open this dot class file let's just open this this is how it looks some cryptic lines of code which we might not understand okay so we want to close this so the point that I'm trying to make is we need to create I mean we need to convert this English language into a language which a processor or a computer would be able to understand which is done by the dot class file okay so the dot class file is something that the processor or the computer would understand all right now the next thing to do is to simply run this Java program okay so how do we do that we have a command called Java hello world and as you can notice once you press enter you see hello world the message has been written on the command prompt well so congratulations if you follow the same steps that we have just seen you'll also see the same message on your screen and well that's your stepping stone to learning Java congratulations you're doing great so all right that's it for this tutorial we will see more details on how what happens when we compile and what happens when we run the program in more details in the next class thank you what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial we are going to look at one more feature which was introduced recently in Java 11 so in the last lecture we saw that a dot class file was generated and then we ran the hello world program which gave us the hello world output so let me go ahead and delete this dot class file okay so initially it was a two-step process first we compiled the program then we executed the program a new feature has been introduced in Java 11 wherein we'll just type this command so notice that we are not writing Java C we are writing simply Java hello world dot Java and we are going to press enter so as you can see on the screen on the left hand side no dot class file was generated however we still got the output as hello world now this feature was introduced in Java 11 so that you could run the single classes quickly without having to write two different commands all right okay that's it for this tutorial see you in the next lecture thank you what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial where we are going to see different compile and execute options now as you can see on the screen there are certain commands and we've got certain description of the commands so the first one was to compile the Java program 
and generate a .class file, which we have already seen. The second one was Java and the Java class name, which was to execute the program, which again we have already seen. The third one was to execute the single program without first compiling it and creating a .class file, which was a feature introduced in Java 11. There are certain other commands as well. For example, this one, what this says is that we need to create, we need to compile the Java program and we need to generate the dot class file in a different folder, for example, pin folder. Okay, so let's, let's, let's take a look at how we are going to do that. All right. Okay, now as you can see, okay, now as you can see, we have this hello world Java file present in our folder. We're going to create a new folder here and we'll name it as bin. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to generate the dot class file and put it inside the bin folder. Okay, so let's take a look at how this could be achieved. Okay, so as we saw, uh, we'll again go back to this one. So as we saw here, what we are going to tell the Java compiler is that this is the name of the program and slash d, dash d, or we can say this is the special command to tell the Java compiler to generate the dot class file and put it in the pin folder. Okay, let's go ahead and do it. Java C hello world dot Java dash D and we're going to say dot slash bin. Okay, so now as we press enter, the Java program got compiled and uh, let's go and look at what are the contents of the bin. So here we are. The bin folder now has the hello world.class file as we have written that command. Now in order to execute this program, make sure that you are present in the bin folder. All right. Okay, so we could successfully execute that Java program uh, where the dot class file was present inside the bin folder. Now, in practical situations, in large applications, there are thousands of Java files that are present. So you cannot have the Java files as well as the dot class file in the same folder. It would be too messy. In order to have the correct differentiation or in order to modularize, or you can say in order to organize your folder well, you can use this command where you generate your dot class files in a, a different folder and you keep your Java files in different folder. All right, now let's take a look at the other commands that we have. Okay, so the next one that we can see is how do we compile multiple programs at a time? Okay, now even that could be done. Compiling multiple programs is allowed in Java at the same time. Okay, so what we are going to do is All right, so what we have done is we just simply went ahead, copied the Java Hello World program and created a, a Hello World 2 dot Java program. And we have also saved it as Hello World 2. We'll also make sure that the public class name is Hello World 2. All right, so the class name should be same as the file name as we saw. So now we've got 
two classes hello world and hello world 2 and we need to simply compile them both at the same time all right so here is the command that we saw so java c the first program dot java space the second program dot java okay so let's do it once java c hello world dot java space hello hello world two dot java okay i'll just expand it a bit doesn't expand okay sorry my bad Okay, so uh, my bad, I was just into the bin folder. We just back in the main folder. What we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to write this command java c hello world dot java space hello world two dot java. Okay, and we're going to press enter. And as soon as we do that, we see that there are two dot class files generated in the same folder now we could have given the dash t command as well which could have led to the dot class files being moved into the bin folder however we since we did not specify that the dot class files are present in the same folder so basically now let's say you want to run any of these java hello world you did get a hello world and now that you can run java you get a hello world too so basically you could compile both these programs now please note that you can compile any number of files at the same time however you can run only one file at a time okay so there is no command to run multiple files at a time okay so remember that we also specified this in the node okay now let's move on to the next command which is to execute a program from another directory so what we're going to do is we are going to again move into the command prompt and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead into this part we're going to delete the dot class files we're going to delete this dot class files we're going to simply we're going to compile only in java c hello world dot java and we're going to say dash d and we're going to put it into the bin folder okay now let's take a look at the dot plus file so here it is okay so we see that the java file is present in the hello world folder and the dot class file is present in the hello world in the bin folder sorry in the bin folder so initially when we ran the java program we navigated it navigated to the bin folder and then we executed the java program however there is another way of doing so without even navigating to that directory so what we say is java then we go to cp which is copy path and here we specify all right so what the syntax for that command is java then we space we have the cp then we specify the path of that program and finally that gets executed so let's let's just take a look at it okay java cp what are you gonna say is that slash bin 
and then finally we're going to say hello world so what it what it means is we are we are going to tell java that go to the pin folder and then execute this hello world program okay so it did go to the hello world program the other way of doing so is to go inside the pin program inside the pin folder and then write java hello world which would again lead to the same however uh, this was a simple demonstration of just a small path there could be a different path where the directory the entire tree directory structure could be different or could be longer so this is one option where you can execute a java program in from another path okay so now let's take a look at the other command so there could be situations where you want to have certain properties at the beginning uh, when you when you pass when you when you want to execute the java program you would want to set certain values so what we call it is a property so let's take a look at the property i mean how how a property could be set in a java program and how it could be used okay so let's take a look at that all right in order to demonstrate the last command i've made certain modifications to the hello world program to begin with here we have used a statement called import java.util.star okay so why do we do this so you're not going to write everything in java on your own okay there are certain classes that you could be using which have already been created and have been already in use so for example there there are there are certain developers who have already created a certain class so you need to just refer to that class so that you can use its functionality now this is exactly what the import statement does so basically what we are trying to say here is that we're going to import a package so basically we can say a package is a collection of java files okay so we're trying to say that there is an inbuilt package called java.util which contains certain java files which contains certain ways or certain methods which can be used directly in our program okay so what we're going to do is we're going to simply import it so that we can use its functionality now if you notice here we have created a properties p equal to system dot get properties so basically we're trying to get certain properties out of the system okay now basically this is a reference and we are assigning this system these properties to this reference okay so basically if you if you don't get it don't worry but it's just the demonstration of this command for which i'm trying to explain the properties here the creation of objects and the references are still going to be discussed in more depth and more detail so don't worry about it don't be don't worry about what this entire syntax means it's just that there is a property there is certain property we're trying to assign these system properties and then we're trying to get this property called as my prop okay my prop and we're going to print it along with hello world okay so let me head out to the command prompt and let's compile this program and then just execute it so that we can simply display the property that we set all right so we're going to compile this program in the same way java c hello world java is created a dot class file and now we're going to simply write another command which is java hyphen d which is capital d remember there is a difference between the capital and a small d commands there are two different commands then without giving a space we just wrote my prop equal to 100 
and then we said hello world so hello world is the name of our class now why my prop in if you have noticed this my prop exactly matches with this my prop okay so what you're trying to say is you're going to declare and define a property while executing the java program the java program is to try and get this property and just print it okay so now as we press enter we're going to say hello world 100 okay so the property that we sent from while executing the java program has been displayed on the command prompt all right so i think we have demonstrated different ways in which java program can be compiled and executed i think that's it for this tutorial i hope you enjoyed it and do practice what we are learning side by side do pause the videos in do pause the videos in between and make sure you type these programs on your system and also execute them and see whether you're able to all right that's it for this tutorial thank you very much and see you in the next lecture what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial where we are going to play around a bit with the hello world java program let's begin as you can see on the screen we have already navigated to the folder where we have the hello world.java file and towards the right you can see the hello world program where i've just removed the comments which were there before all right so just to show you that comments are not important as such all right so let's make certain modifications to this program and see how the compiler behaves or how the jdk behaves with it okay to begin with i'm going to remove this public i'm going to save it and i'm going to head over to the command prompt and i'm going to try compiling it all right it did get compiled and as you can see on the top the hello world dot class got generated now we're going to try running this as well and we got the hello world so the first thing to note is that the public keyword is not compulsory or you can say it's not mandatory all right now let's try something else i'm going to change this to hello world 2 and i'm going to make it hello world 2 all right and i'm going to also delete the hello world dot class file okay well, let's try now notice that the class hello world 2 has a different name than the file name so let's let's try compiling it okay it got compiled but as you can see hello world 2 dot class got generated okay so basically the name of the class that we have specified here a dot class file of that name was generated okay now usually this is how we execute the java program so it would say could not find or load main class hello world and it kind of gave an exception or it gave an error where it said that the class was not found let's try this one yep this got executed so always remember this that the dot class file would be generated with the name that you specify here all right and not with the name that is matching with the file name okay so that is another thing that we just saw let me just remove this part head back to the hello world i'm just going to delete it 
all right now let me head over to this piece okay or let's say just let's remove this part all right just remove the curly braces i'm going to save it and i'm going to say java c hello world java let's try compiling and let's see what happens all right so this gave a compile time error so there are two types of error that you need to focus on one is the compile time errors where in case there is any error in the syntax there would be a compile time error and if there is an error while running the program or executing the program there would be a runtime error okay so what this says is that it expects a curly brace after the hello world class name okay so let me put it here okay i'm just putting it afterwards i'm going to save this file i'm going to again run the java c hello world dot java and it got compiled a dot class file was generated and now let's try executing java hello world it did give me a hello world message all right so what we just learned is that if there is an error in the syntax it's going to give you a compile time error okay and it will not generate a dot class file until you fix that error and then again compile the file also another thing to note is that this curly brace could be present either here or here anywhere all right the point being there should be a brace after this class name okay now let's move on to the next thing public static void main as we saw this was the method which is the main method which gets executed first whenever a java program is uh, executed let's remove this public and see what happens okay i've saved it i'm going to compile it yet again so note one more thing that if you have already a dot class file present in your folder and you recompile your java program it's going to replace that file and as you can see the date modified just changed here which means we got the latest compiled file right so let's go here and uh, well now you can see that the dot class file was generated however we got an error saying that the main method not found in class hello world please define the main method as and they have also specif specified the signature the signature that they are expecting is public static void main and in the parentheses we got a string argument parameter okay well now let's put public back here and remove static okay i saved it i'm gonna recompile it it got it got compiled i'm gonna run it yet again the same error main method is not static in class hello world please define the main method as this okay so static now let me just remove it remove this part this piece called void and save it compile it okay so this time we got a compile time error now why is that because the method declaration expects a return type so there should always be a return type present when we have a method declaration okay so a return type means whether that method is able to return something for now this method does not return anything which which uh, requires the method to be having a void as a return type at least okay now since it did not match that we were given a compile time error okay 
and not a runtime error. So I'm going to put void back again. All right, now let me just make this as a capital M. And again, try to compile it. Okay, so this got compiled. There we go. Yet again, the same error. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna now go ahead and make this main back to small and we're gonna say let's say maybe int okay so for now all right so i've just changed it to integer where mean which means that i'm trying to expect an integer argument which is an array so these open open brackets denote an array so let me just save it I'm trying to compile it it got compiled i'm going to try to run it yet again Okay, we got the same error. Let me head out and just change this to string. So what this basically means is we're trying to expect a string argument here, which is an array. Okay, so now that I've just, let me just remove this open brace and I'm gonna compile it yet again I get a compile time error now why is that because we removed this curly brace which was expected as a part of the syntax and we tried to compile it so it gave us a compile time error okay let me just put it back and I'm gonna recompile it that's successful and yes execution is successful now let me just remove this semicolon I'm going to try to run this sorry I'm going to try to execute it so it says a semicolon is expected after this line so remember this one more very important aspect that all these statements right these need to be ended with a semicolon so if you have another statement here the semicolon is required so that the java compiler would be able to differentiate between your statements okay so that's it now we're gonna try to compile this Java program and run it so it's gave it gave me hello world twice because I've written the statement twice okay all right now let's try to explore this piece okay uh, not very much in detail but we'll just see a brief in So what I'm trying to do here is that I'm trying to get the first argument that is passed. So an array could be a list of, or you can say a couple of strings which we pass to the Java program. So I'm trying to get the first one. So. All right, so I'm, what I'm trying to do basically is I'm trying to access the first element of the array okay the first element is always denoted by zero don't worry if you are too over overwhelmed by what we are saying now remember this is just an array so it would look something like a b c this is the first element then we got a t h e name this is the third one 
So basically, if you see, this is the zeroth element, this is the first element, this is the second element. Okay, so what I'm trying to get here is ABC. Okay, all right, let me just save this file <clears throat> and let me go over here. I'm going to compile this. It did get compiled. Now I'm going to make a minor modification here while I try to execute the program. I'm going to put in double quotes, I'm going to put ABC. Okay. And see when we try to execute it, we got hello world ABC here. Okay. So which means this is an argument which I'm trying to pass while I'm trying to execute the program. Okay. Now let's try doing this. And this time I'm not going to pass ABC. Okay, let's see what happens. Well, we got an array index out of bound exception. Okay, so why is that exception? Because in this program, we are trying to access the first element of this array, which we haven't specified while trying to execute the program. Okay, so which is why we got this exception array index out of bound because basically this is an array okay as we just saw all right i think that's it for this tutorial see you in the next class thank you what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial let's take a look at some fundamentals so you already seen that these uh, double forward slashes denote a comment all right so there's another way actually to denote a comment which is this so forward slash followed by a star then whatever your comment is and in the end just mention a star and a forward slash let's take a look okay so as you can see here we have the hello world program and here we have mentioned this comment this could be placed anywhere, whether it's outside the class, whether it's inside the class, or whether it's inside the uh, method. So a comment could be placed anywhere inside the file. Okay, so let's try to just compile it. Well, it got compiled. Now it's, we're going to my bad we have to just remove this okay we are going to now just execute this program and here it is Okay, so that's about how we write a comment in the code. Okay, so the next thing to note is the character set and uh, Java supports Unicode characters and these characters denote the alphabets, digits and special symbols on the keyboard. All right, that's it for this tutorial. Thank you and see you in the next class. What's up guys? Welcome to this new tutorial. Well, let's take a bit step further to explore a bit more about this hello world.java program. All right. Now, as you can see on the screen, you see two statements here where we are printing hello world and my name, and then we are printing my name. I mean, Amaya Thatte is an engineer. Okay. So is there a way or we can say, is there a different way of doing so? So what we can do here is that we'll just declare a string. We'll say name equal to, okay. Now I want to not write my name twice, which is why I declared it once here and I'm going to 
use this string name below okay now what we call this is a variable so name is a variable here okay and it holds the value as Amir well now we've seen this before so what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to do okay now what this does this plus sign does is just concat the name variable contents to the hello world okay similarly I'm going to do the same thing here okay I'm just going to okay so let me just compile this program and then I'm going to so as you can see the name has been printed hello world Amir and Amit Hatte is an engineer okay all right now since we said that this is a variable this can change its value okay so what we're going to do here is going to slightly modify this code and we are going to say name equal to name plus okay so what we're going to do is we're going to say that here my name hello world I'm here and then here we are going to change this to name plus surname and then we are going to print this statement okay so let's just go ahead I'm gonna clear the screen here and and then I'm gonna run it all right so as we saw this is a variable whose value could be changed over the time all right now that's it about the variables so it could either be a string it could also be an integer so for example you just want to say int let's say score in math equal to 100 okay so I just say that well Well, you're gonna say name so space scored space current math space in math okay so now what we are trying to do here is we are going to say that my name the variable the value is here and I say the name scored this one this much in math that's what we are trying to print here so basically this is an integer it's not a string this is 100 it's not a string so what we are trying to do is we are going to try to concat all these values and together create a message okay so let me now compile this program and run it and this is how we see it on the screen if you see the third message it's concatenated and put together a message Amit Hatte scored 100 in math all right that's it about the variables that we saw thank you all right so let's experiment a bit more in this hello world.java class so what we're going to do is we're going to simply remove this line and we're going to put this here under okay so what we're going trying to do is we're going to try to see whether the score in math 
right it's referred here but it's declared below so is it allowed in java that's what we're going to try it out okay well, let's compile and we see we got an error saying that it cannot find the symbol score in math okay so remember this always that if you want to use a variable it must be declared before being used okay so it has to be before this line okay now let's try another thing and we'll say that we're gonna pick this up we're gonna remove it and we're gonna put this here okay let's see if this works I'm gonna clear my screen and I'm gonna compile it and what just happened here so we are saying here that a non-static variable name cannot be referenced from the static context okay so basically what it's trying to say is since this is a static method it's expecting this also to be static let's do this now what we're going to do is we're going to again compile it yes it got compiled and run it there we go so a variable could be declared in a class or it could be declared inside the method okay now if your method is static your variable inside the class must also be static if your method is not static then this static keyword should not be present even in the variable name all right and that's it so we'll just take a pause here and then summarize what we saw about the variables but even before that what we can do is uh, what we can do is we can say not here and a equal 10 b okay so we can declare these as an integer so a has a value of 10 and b does not have any value so let's just see what we can see so i'm going to say a equal to plus a and then i'm going to add a space and then say okay let me compile it and there we go so b should have been initialized before okay so it let let me make just give me some value here There we go a is 10 and b is 5 so basically what we're trying to say here is that what we are trying to say here is that when you declare a variable here and if you want to use it when it's inside your uh, code what you need to do is it should have a certain value to begin with okay now when b did not have a value we got a compile time error right and the compile time error was might not have been initialized so we basically have to initialize it with some kind of a value now let me just remove this one let me just say its name okay and maybe we can move this end on the top okay and as we all know we have to make this a static 
because we're going to reference it here inside the static method. Now let's see what happens here. Compile it, run it, we got null. And we got the value of a as 0. Now that's quite strange. So let's understand this. So basically, if you declare your variables here inside the class, it's going to take the default values. Okay, so the default for an integer is 0 and the default for a string is null, which is why it printed null here and then null and then this value and a got a value as 0. Okay, so now we saw the various ways of declaring a variable, initializing a variable. So let's just look at a brief summary. Okay, so coming to the summary, variables are basically a programming element whose value can change during the course of the execution of a program and they must be declared before being used. The variables can be declared inside the class or inside a method and there are a few examples that we saw. All right, that's it for the variable tutorials. Thank you. What's up guys, welcome to this new tutorial. So we saw how we declared a variable and how we use them in our program. Let's take a step further and let's say that the variable name, right? Let's say this variable, I want to make sure that the value that I assign to will not change over time. Okay, basically I want to make it a constant. So I say is equal to and uh, I want to say that this name remains a constant. Okay, I want to re simply remove this or let's say I'll just keep it. Okay, but the way of doing so, the way of saying that you do not want to change a certain value is by making this as final. Okay, so this final keyword denotes that you cannot make any further modifications to this value that is assigned to the name. Okay, however, in our program, we see here that we have make some kind of modification that we are basically concatenating my surname yet again even though it's declared as a final so let's just see what happens when we compile here so we got a compile time error saying that cannot assign a value to a final variable name now why is that because name is now a constant so let me just remove it so let's compile it got compile and here we are okay so basically this is how we declare a constant now let's try one more thing let's just remove this and let's just put it here okay oops We don't need the static word here inside. I'm gonna We got it. So you can declare a constant inside a class or inside a method. And if you want a certain variable to be declared as a constant, use the final keyword. And in your program, if you ever try to modify this constant variable it will throw a compile time error okay so i think uh, let's take a brief let's take a brief look at what we just discussed about these constants okay now as you can see what we discussed is about the constants so it's also known as a literal and they're generally declared in uppercase, although our variable was not in uppercase, but 
do remember that constants are generally declared in uppercase in Java and they can be declared inside a class or a method and this is their general form where we have the final keyword and then we have the data type we have the constant name and it's assigned to some value and here is an example of a constant all right that's it for the constant tutorial see you in the next class what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial here we're going to look at the naming conventions of the identifier so what is an identifier identifier is basically a name which is given to a variable a constant or an array or a class or a method so it's basically your name that you give and there are certain rules that need to be followed while naming so as we can see here it can be any sequence of an uppercase lowercase a digit or underscore or a dollar sign okay so the names are case sensitive and they must not begin with a digit and also they cannot be used as an identifier name keywords cannot be used as an identifier name so here are some examples where we say this is hello is allowed this capital small is allowed hello with certain numbers is allowed hello with certain numbers and a dollar sign is allowed number beginning with number is not allowed you cannot declare an identifier name as int because int is a data type that is like a reserved word which we will see in the next part and then we can declare dollar hello we cannot declare hash hello because the only special character allowed is dollar sign okay so that's about the naming conventions in of the identifiers do make sure that you remember these while writing java programs and uh, and here are certain keywords that are present in java so you cannot declare your identifiers with these names so you cannot declare int true you cannot declare int false or int while or volatile as we move in forward in this course we will see a lot of these variables we will see a lot of these keywords and what they actually mean in java world all right that's it for this tutorial see you in the next class thank you what's up guys welcome back to another tutorial where we are going to focus on java methods so before starting let's go through a brief concept and a brief theory of what a method is so basically a method is a group of statement required to perform a certain task or a certain requirement and they are always a part of a certain class and they define the behavior of a class okay and it's always a good practice to create separate methods for performing different tasks the main advantage of a method is code reusability wherein we write a method once and we can use it multiple times this also improves the maintainability of the code and ease of debugging which we will see later in our course a method may or may not have parameters and it must return a value of a certain type known as the return type if the return type is not void a method can be of two types one is the system defined methods which is the library method for example we saw the println which is actually a method that java has provided us and the second part is the user defined methods the ones which we as developers write okay now let's take a look at the method signature and an example so we've got an optional access modifier just like we saw public then we've got an optional non-access modifier which is static then we got a return type we got a method name then we got the optional parameters in round brackets we got open parentheses and closed parentheses which will define the scope of the method and inside these parentheses we write the logic and we return the value if the return type is other than void so for an example if we need to have a sum of two numbers we take two inputs a and b which are integers and we just return a plus b 
that's a very small example we'll also head over to the notepad and the cmd to see the practical all right now as you can see on the screen we have the sample class which we created in the void main we have written this statement called as print name and we have created a method called as print name which is public static void print name and we are just trying to print out hello amir all right let's compile this program and let's run it and this is how the message was printed so this is one of the example of a user created method now notice the word static the reason why we have this static word is because we are calling it from a static method so if we remove this method which is uh, i mean if we remove this keyword now let's save it let's compile it here we go we got a compile time error saying that non-static method print name cannot be referenced in the static context okay so there is another way to call this method basically and we'll just look at that way all we need to do is create a object of this class sample s is equal to new sample okay and we'll say a start print name so we created an object sample class and sample class has certain members okay so when we create an object so basic, basically this is a this part of the code is the reference and we are assigning it to a new object so whenever you create an object you need to specify with new and these parentheses so this is basically creating a new object of the same class of the sample class and once we do that we can access the members of that class so since print name is a member of this class we just wrote as dot print name okay now we'll get into more details of what an object is and all those stuff but for now remember these are two we two ways of invoking a method okay this is also known as method invocation all right now let's head on to the <coughs> got compiled and we're gonna run it there we go so these are two ways of invoking a method either declare the method as a static method if you're calling it from a static method or you can create an object and then invoke that method using the object uh, reference okay so let's now take a step forward and see what if i create two methods of the same name okay trying to compile it and we say this is already defined in this class okay so you can uniquely define a method only once however now let's say I take this string name okay and I say that So I've got two, two methods with the same name. The only difference is that one of them has a parameter called name and the other one doesn't. Okay, now let's see if this is allowed. Well, it is compiled and now we're gonna run it. So we see that hello Amir is printed on the screen. The message is printed on the screen. 
Now, the way this compiler works is that it created an object of the sample class. Then we have specified this print name function without any parameters. Okay, so had we called the print name with a certain parameter, it would have invoked this uh, this method, the print name with a argument method. So this is also known as uh, method. So this is also known as method over, overloading. Okay. So it's also known as method overloading, wherein we see that we have a same method name and all it differs is just in the parameter name. Okay. So now let's go ahead here and say that s dot print name and we'll pass a parameter. We'll make it jack. Okay. All right. So now let's save it and here we go. We saw that the first method was invoked because no parameters were passed and the second method was invoked here because one parameter was passed. And this is known as object overloading uh, in Java and in all other object oriented programming languages. Okay. Now let's see if I change this return type. Okay. Now, as we have seen in the theory that if there is a return type other than void, we must return something. Okay. So what I'm going to return is return one. Now why one? Because one is an integer. Okay, we'll go into more depths of what is a data type in the upcoming sessions. But for now, since this is an int, I have to return a certain integer back. Okay. Now, going ahead to the command prompt and trying to compile it. This got compiled. And here we go. Okay. So, Okay, so basically what we saw is that the method name was same. The difference was in the return type as well as in the parameter list. Now you could have multiple parameters in a given method. Okay, uh, and that that can be achieved by a, having a comma in between. So let's say the string sir name. Okay, just pass the surname here. And make it do jack do so you can have multiple parameters passed over here okay now we're gonna re again compile this program it got compiled and we're gonna run it so here we go we got the output all right so we can do this basically And okay, so we got hello Jack Doe as the second message. All right. Okay, now we said that the access modifier is optional. Let's remove it. I'm going to remove it from both the methods. And we're going to simply, there we go. So this is just a brief about how a method can be declared and how methods with same name are also allowed in Java. Okay. But they must differ in the list of parameters or return type and the return type. Okay. So that's it about the brief introduction to what a method is. Now method is a building block of the Java program, which is why we have introduced you to the method. And we'll get into more details of writing more different user defined methods 
and uh, also see the user defined uh, sorry also see the system methods system defined methods in the next tutorial all right thank you guys what's up guys welcome back to another tutorial on methods in this tutorial we are going to cover up the system defined methods and one of the methods that we have already seen is the system.out.println and this is a system defined method which actually prints whatever message we specify okay we'll come across a lot of system defined methods in this course and this uh, and we'll also learn more theory on those methods as well but for now just for your knowledge and just for you to know that there are system defined methods we just covered up, covered this piece up all right that's it for this tutorial thank you guys what's up guys welcome back to another tutorial on data types so basically what is a data type a program contains variables and constants and they must have a data type now a data type denotes what kind of data is held in that variable or a constant or if what kind of data is returned from a method okay so as you can see on the screen the data types in Java are mainly classified into two the first being primitive data type and the second one is non primitive data type in case of primitive data types there are further classified into numeric and non numeric and the numeric data types are byte short int long float and double the non numeric ones are char and boolean as far as non primitive data types are concerned they are defined by the programmer except for the string and string builder and the string buffer okay now another point to note is that java is a strongly typed language now what that means is that we would specifically require to define a certain type of a data fix a uh, data type in order to tell what kind of data can be held and not something which is more of a generic data type okay which is why java is a strongly typed language okay now moving ahead to the next piece let's take a look at the primitive data types the ones which are offered by java so there are eight primitive data types which are present in java which are byte short int long float double char and boolean and as you can see on the screen these are the number of bits that are required to persist the data and these are the number of bytes as you can see here and additionally we are also specified the range of values that can be present inside these certain data types okay so byte can only hold values from minus 128 to plus 127 a short can hold values from minus 32768 to 32767 so on and so forth and a character can hold unicode values a boolean can hold true or false and another point to note is that primitive data types are stored in stack memory okay uh, now having said that and having gone through the theory of a data type let's go ahead and uh, try out a few examples for data types okay now as you can see we have created a new learn data types java file we have also navigated to the folder in which we have saved this learn data types java then we have this class which we have defined here we have a main method 
and now we are going to start learning about data types okay let's begin with the smallest one first so we're going to say byte b is equal to 120 okay and what we're going to do is we're going to simply print this out okay what Let's compile it. It got compiled. We can see a dot class being created here. Okay. Now we could print the value whatever we persisted. All right. Now what we have seen in the theory is that byte can hold data from minus 127 to plus 128 sorry my bad minus 128 to plus 127 let's try to put a value which is beyond that range okay and let's see what happens let's press the up arrow and you'll see these here we go we we got this error called as incompatible types possible lossy conversion from int to byte okay so basically what it's trying to say is that this value is not in the range of what a byte can hold and this is like an integer for java so that's the reason it is giving us this error okay so that's how we what all we need to do is make sure that a value lies in between the range okay well, let's try for short And we are going to simply print this short value here. Okay, let's run it. Got compile. And we got the value as well. So let's say we made some modifications to this number and we said that it is this. Something which is beyond the range in which, which is applicable for short. And we got the same exact error saying incompatible types, possible lossy conversion from int to short. Okay, so it's again considering this as an int value since it's something which is not in the range of a short. Okay, all right, now let's make it back to this, and now let's go ahead to see what an int can store let's say we just stored a hundred here and we are just going to print it out here here we are going to compile it and run it and we got a hundred okay all right now let's try to assign this value which is so this is the maximum value allowed to an int we'll put something more and we are going to here we go integer number too large this is slightly different kind of an exception that we got from what we have got here but all it's trying to say is this is something beyond the range which is applicable for an integer okay let's just say this and let's see let's try to assign this to a long okay let's see what happens and we're going to print this long we're going to learn we're going to compile it and we can see we got an error saying that long l is equal to 
this okay it says that integer number too large why is that so for a number to be considered as a long you need to specifically have this L in the end of this number okay so that this number is considered as a long otherwise it is treated as an integer and it would follow the same rules as that which are applicable to a integer okay let's try this out now got compiled and we got this value okay all right now let's uh, go ahead and okay i just put a float value here saying that this is assigned as 3 and we are going to All right, so we are going to compile it and we are going to run it. Okay, now notice that we mentioned three here to float. However, we got a 3.0. The only reason being that float is a floating point data type. Okay, so if you do not specify any number after the decimal, it by default gives you a dot zero after it okay all right okay let's try this storing a 3.6 in a float and let's see what happens we got an error saying possible lossy conversion from double to float okay why is that because by default if you specify a number which has a decimal it's considered as a double so we need to specifically tell the compiler that this is actually a float so you need to specify with an f in the end okay all right so compile it and we got 3.6 okay all right now let's take a look at how we use double and we are going to print the value there we go yet again we saw that we assigned 3 but in the output we got 3.0 the reason being it's a it's like a floating point data type and if no value is present after the decimal it by default gives you a dot zero okay all right now let's again try to put this as a value 3.6 and let's compile it and it got compiled the reason being by default the java compiler uh, considered this 3.6 as a double which we are anyways assigning it to a double variable so that's the reason we did not have to specifically say that a D is required okay it's optional however if you specify this D there is no harm okay so we'll compile it again and we'll run it so we got a 3.6 okay so this D is optional however this F is compulsory this L is also compulsory only now this F is compulsory in situations where you have a decimal number this L is compulsory if there is a number that is assigned to long which is outside the valid range of an integer okay all right well let's move ahead to boolean let me make it b on purpose
we got an error saying variable b is already defined in the method main now why is that because we have assigned this variable b here it's a byte we can't use the same name again in our program if it's in the same method okay so we need to make it like this and we need to make it like this so that it will be able to compile it and we got the value as true so a boolean holds only true and false and this is how you assign the boolean value without any codes to a boolean okay now let's move on to care and let's just print it it got compiled and we printed a okay all right now let's try to put a t here let's see what happens nope not allowed that's because a character can only hold one character at a time and not more than one okay I'm going to compile it again and it got compiled all right guys that's it for this tutorial we will see you in the next class thank you what's up guys welcome to this new tutorial on non primitive data type called as string string is an inbuilt data type that java has provided and it's basically a class which can store objects that so so which can store values which is a group of characters or an array of characters so java allows to manipulate strings create substrings replace strings replace characters in a string concat format strings and it offers plenty of inbuilt methods for string manipulation so there are various ways of how you can create a string and this is one of the way string can be created as string s equal to simply assigning a value in double quotes now since string is an object it can also be created as string s is equal to new string and in the parenthesis and in sing, uh, double quotes we mention the string so always remember this that in order to create an object you use the keyword new okay so this is a second method of creating a string the third way of creating a string is through an array so this is from a character array and i know we haven't yet seen what an array is but if you see on the screen this is just a basic of how a character array is uh, declared so it's basically char and we have these square brackets the name of the array which is equal to in curly braces we have mentioned the elements of this array okay so the third way of creating a string is from a character array so for now just remember that this is how an array is created and in the future lectures in the upcoming lectures we are going to definitely cover up more on arrays okay now the string class is immutable so what that means is that once it is created a string object cannot be changed so whenever we change any string a new instance is created okay so if you have a string s called as hello and then you assign hello world to this uh variable s then it's going to be creating a new object every time you modify this string which is which is also known as immutable now there are instances in real world applications where you might need to manipulate strings uh and if if it if it is actually a necessity to make a lot of modifications to string then you might as well use string buffer and string builder classes which are much more performance uh have a much better performance than what a string is so they won't be creating new objects every time you manipulate the string so we'll cover these in the 
upcoming tutorial. Now, another interesting point about the string is that each time you create a string, the JVM checks the string constant pool first. Now, if the string already exists in the pool, a reference to the pool instance is returned. So if the string doesn't exist in the pool, a new string instance is created and placed in the pool. Now, if we look at this example, it says string s is equal to hello and this would create a new object in the object pool. Then we have a string s1 which is also assigned the exact same value. So the compiler actually checks that there is already a variable which has the exact same value as the one uh, we are assigning the second time. So this is going to point to the above object until its value is same. Now the moment you change the value of s1 is going to create a new object of string. Okay, now that's it about the theory of string. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and look at some practical examples. Okay, so now we have navigated to of our folder in which we have our Java classes. We have created a new Java class called as learn strings and we have created uh, this Java file. We have typed this program. So here we have written string s is equal to first in first is written in the double quotes. So this is one of the ways of creating a string. So let's compile this program and there we go. So we got this output as first. Now what we are going to do is Okay, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to print this S2 here on the screen. We compile it and here we go. So this is the second method of creating a string. Okay, now what we're going to say is care In single quotes, we have these elements. Okay, so we, we've we have defined a character array which has five elements H E L L O. Okay, and now we're going to create a third string out of this. Let's try this first and let's see what <coughs> issues we get. So what we are trying to say is we are simply trying to assign a character array to a string. So ideally it shouldn't be allowed. Okay, let's try compiling it. And we got an error saying that character array cannot be converted to a string. So the way we do it is using the new string and what we're going to do is we're going to print S3. Okay, let's compile it. It got compiled and here we got hello. So that was the third way of uh, having us creating a string. And let's do one more. So I'm just assigning one string to another and I'm going to print it.
okay it works all right i think uh, that's the basic of how a string can be declared a string variable can be declared we saw the ways it could be declared now in the next tutorial we are going to learn about some some of the most commonly used inbuilt methods in java okay all right that's it for this tutorial thank you guys thank you for watching